and this is a 2023 thing too, I think we'll see is downgrades. So customer bought 50 seats all year this year. We're going to hear about, I only really need 30, right? Or I yeah. overextended. Yeah. So I think, I think managing the downgrade this year and sort of a net, if you think about net retention, yeah. managing the downgrades this year. We're, you're pushing everybody to sign these three-year deals. It's really easy to get somebody to sign a three-year deal if you give them a 30-day out. How do you let somebody out of a deal? What you just talked about, somebody bought 50 seats and they got a discount on those 50 yeah. seats and then they want to downgrade. Well, you got to- Yeah, I mean, more. you have to have that hard conversation about, well, your your price discount was based on X. You want to go to Y. That's I mean, you're only going to save, you know, if I raise your rate as a result, you're only going to save X. Yeah, if the question's keep, about keep saving the money- seats, Right. Yeah, keep yeah. the seats, you know, so you don't have to add on later or whatever. So I think well, that's where that's, the ROI probably comes into play, right? The ROI so, helps, I would say, and that's where you have to have. I, in my personal opinion, and we're I'm thankful at Comply that we have this. We have a very talented renewals team who has the moxie and the skills to have those conversations and really, really work through those. And we're sending one of our businesses um, has a a very strong add on portfolio, but customers can kind of turn that stuff on and off, and, and that's causing um, you know, some dissonance that we've got to fix. And so we're sending yeah. those requests through our renewals team to really like, why are you turning it off? What do you, what would you rather have instead? We've got a laundry list of stuff here. And so that, you know, it's hard, it's, it's hard work. And I think, you know, where, where you said, how do you let them out? I like, if we've wronged the customer and it's, we've blown it up. Like, I mean, that, that's one conversation, right? I think that that's when you have to sort of just do the right thing for the customer. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other ones, you're just, you're just trying, you know, usually have terms that we, we tend to stick to pretty um, closely. If you read Jason Lemkin though, like the Godfather says, he's like, let customers out. You'll never get them back. If you don't sort of, if you, if you are a pain in the ass, right. Uh, when they want to leave. And so I think there's, there's a middle ground there somewhere, but um, there's certainly lots of theories on that. Well, you have to be easy to do business with if that rings a bell and yeah. You know, it's so hard to get somebody to recommend you, but you diss somebody. Oh my God, they'll spend all night. Never forget it, right? They'll never and forget tell it. everybody. So you you gotta let them out. You know, if yeah, look, if it were working that well, whatever it was, <laughs> they keep. They wouldn't want out, right? Exactly. Right. They wouldn't want right. out, <laughs> right? Hi, I'm Bill Mahoney. I'm the Chief Customer Officer for Comply. I don't know how the hell I got here, but you're listening to the SaaS Holes Podcast. Welcome to SaaS Holes. We are revenue ops with an edge. With decades of making interesting decisions, Jamie, Jason, Marcus, and Pete are dedicated to helping aspiring sales leaders accelerate revenues with our no BS approach to sales leadership strategies and tactics. Our show is supported by listeners and viewers just like you. DemandFarm.com. Unlock key account growth with Demand Farm's large deal, key account, and relationship intelligence products. Go to DemandFarm.com now to schedule a demo. Ask for Iron Man. Brent Keltner's Winalytics Revenue Acceleration Playbook Masterclass. In five hours over five weeks, help your sales and go-to-market team build the mindset and skills for a new buyer environment. Kickoff and product driven selling versus authentic conversations for all go to market teams. Team level sessions for self assessment and team dialogue. All go to market team wrap up to identify top go to market strategy adjustments. Go to winalytics.com now. We got some shout outs to do. Susie Richard got promoted to vice president at Spins. Christina Bolas promoted to senior manager recruiting at Spokio. Hank Dudek got a new gig vice president at Global HR Research. Michael Croplin, new gig vice president business development at Bayard Advertising Agency. Joanna Jaworski, two years at Salesforce. Scott Chagone, three years at Marquee Sports Network. Matt Witt, what's going on, buddy? One year at Equity Lifestyle Properties Incorporated. 
Daniel Selly, eight years at Berkshire Hathaway. Keisha Shams, one year at Spins. Mariel Kokus, one year at lineup.ai. Andrea Roscoe, one year at Arca in Studio Dip. Jason Weika, four years at the City of Lake Forest. Doing a great job, my friend. Keep it going. Ellie Contry, promoted to Senior Intake Specialist at Illinois Housing Development Authority. Fredrick Woldansky, 17 years at Career Builder. Aaron Price, new gig, Regional Sales Director, Enterprise Solutions at Cvent. Sarah Longley, one year at Provita. Jason Holbeck, new gig, President at Crelate. James Kenler, new position, Head of Marketing at Shopping Gives. Brett Stenke, starting a new gig, Mid-Market Account Executive at Zendesk. Eric Larry promoted to VP of Sales at Triumph Technology Solutions. Tom Slocum got a new gig as strategic advisor at Ledium. Evan Ross, 11 years at cars.com. What's going on, old school? Jennifer Fisher, new gig, success advocate at membrane.com. Katie Collins, new gig as client executive, strategic accounts at Salesforce at Gartner. John Pernsteiner, new gig, head of data strategy at Lightcast. Leah Dame, new gig. Head of Commercial Sales at Builder.io. Dan Meyer, new gig, Vice President of Digital Sales, Delivery at Corporate Visions. Jennifer Mall, one of my best ones. Two years at Grubhub. Congrats, Jen. And Tony Jackson, new gig, Senior Advisor at Sales Impact Academy. Bill Mahoney, how the hell are you? Welcome to the Sassels Podcast. It is a thrill and privilege to be here, Pete. Jason, uh, it's been a while since I've seen both of your faces, but this is great. Yep. Uh, happy to be part of this podcast. You guys have a great following. The content's awesome. Let's get into it. Well, you can't start a show with with, with two lies, but we'll go ahead anyways. Yeah, I guess so. It's a new year. I'm trying it's to be a... more positive. <laughs> so, Bill, how the hell do we know each other? Jason, how do we know Bill? We all worked together when we all worked at Career Builder. Ah, if you can believe it, Bill, what did you do at career builder? So I ran the account management organization, which was actually on the customer side of the business, uh, for a guy named Mark Hargis, who we all know is super sharp. Hargis. Uh, yeah. Super I worked for Hargis sharp. for six years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to we'll have to get him on the we'll show. Ho- we'll, we'll hope he's listening. Right. See. Yeah. Right. Um, right. and I see. ran, I mean, if you think about what customer success is in SAS now, that's yeah. the, we had that at Career Builder back then, probably yeah. with a little uh, sales support thrown in, yeah, right? Yeah. We would support the sales reps and that sort of thing. So trainings, getting people to use the platform, consumption-based in some cases, and just trying to support the revenue organization to you know continue to win more deals and have happy customers. And and so they had that all set up when I got there, and we expanded it. And at some one point, I had like 100 people on that team. And um, it was really like, as I think about where my career's gone now, it was really like, it was customer success before anybody was talking about it that way. Yeah. yeah. How did it turn from customer service to success? What is the difference? More touches or? Yeah, good question. Yeah. So I think as as um, software, you know, started eating the world, as people say that that the understanding of how you get customers to renew is to make sure that they're adopting the software, right? So I think that's where the the line moved from like just answering questions to, hey, we know there's four or five things in our software that customers need to use in order to be successful that is going to make the renew renewal a, a slam dunk. And so I think that's how the transition started is like, well, we, we can't have them just answering questions. We have to proactively go out, help them learn how to use the software in ways that either we see successful customers doing or in the ways that we as the as the provider know will make them successful. I think so over time as that evolution happened is how it made this move into success. And there's still, I would say, you know, all kinds of innovation within customer success going on even today as, you know, people are trying to figure out how to scale it, how to make it profitable, how to, how to bring the best possible service to customers. Again, my, my thing I think about all the time is how do we make the renewal a slam dunk? Hopefully with some growth, hopefully with a price increase. Uh, but those are the things that we're trying to figure out how our teams can, get customers successful in their, in their platform today. So the renewal is the easiest conversation in the world. Cause that's what you need for recurring revenue. And is that what separates it bill from, from like professional services, you know, as a SaaS business, like you want to, you don't want as much professional services and you want this renewal, you know, monthly renewal revenue. Is that another thing that separates, you know, service from support kind of thing? Yeah, I think so. So I think you have like, there's two sides of it, right? So yeah, when you think of support, there's the tech support, 
break, fix, question yeah. and answer, Can't that twenty four five. Yeah, all that stuff. You just absolutely like need to be really great at because when when the customers come to you, they need help right then on whatever yeah. it is they're working on. So that part's got to be good. But to your point, ProServe, I think, you know that's another large umbrella that companies are kind of moving a lot of things under, but I, I view it as sort of like the onboarding experience, right? You got to get that right. And usually that got sits it. in a professional service organization to get people off on the right foot. Right. So they're they're They don't have like a failure to launch and they hate, yeah. don't hate you from the beginning, all those things. Yeah. But then yeah. ProServe can fill in sort of like, sometimes you see it as strategy, a consulting fill in a, 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 like a one-time engagement. Um, and so that takes on a lot of forms depending on the type of software you have and what customers are using you for. Um, but I think, you know, where I've seen customers do that really well is to pair success with like sort of a best practices uh, professional service play that you can charge for give away yeah. or make part of the renewal. Um, and that's pretty powerful uh, in and of itself. And uh, I think the good companies that do both those probably have higher retention rates, do those well, I would say have higher retention rates. Well, how did success evolve? Let's see, it, customer service to success. And uh, maybe Hargis said, uh, you know what? Let's look at this customer just bought the product. Let's establish a relationship. And then let's see if they log in. Is that was the first, yeah. you know, they yeah. bought it and nobody's logging in. What, what That's was the problem, first right? Step? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think it was just, are they using it? And, and at career builder, remember we had, so we, you know, it was, are they using it? But then like, are they, are they burning their job? So in some of these plays, there's a consumption angle, right? Like we just got to mm -hmm. get them to use yeah, what usage. they bought you, yeah, or, or the next yeah. one, they're going to buy half. Right. And so that was sort of like, how do we get them to use it? And how do we get them to post more jobs? And so the whole idea then became like, we need to train them really well. We need to make, uh, make their, their do it themselves super easy. And so that whole motion of just getting them comfortable in the software, getting them comfortable on the platform, uh, all the different forms that takes, whether you host webinars or whether you do it one-on-one -on -one or whether you, you know, have an education channel, all those types of things. Um, we had to make sure that they were in there, they were using, they, they found it easy. And then, you know, on, on the inside, then you're giving uh, feedback to product like, hey, they hate it when we make them do this or this would be great. Something we're hearing them ask for and having that be data driven through support tickets and things like that is helpful, too. So I think that's like it just started as let's get them in the software. Then it's like, let's get them to do the things we, we know are important and let's get them to use the jobs that they have. Right. Um, and then let's give them recommendations on how to use it like what we see our A customer is doing because every every customer wants to know what other customers in their space are doing or what the best customers are doing so let's use that as a kind of a talk track to get them where we want them to go yeah. corporate marketing side how did yeah how did you get involved into that or how did that come into because seriously this is we're talking 20 years yeah. ago and this is yeah, the yeah. building blocks of <laughs> right you're right? dating us pete you're dating us <laughs> it it really started because bill and i like to drink beer together so i think we were just we started doing that and then we figured out what we could be really doing together. Well, I think, you know, probably how it started is um, I was, I was in Chicago, Bill was in Atlanta. So I would go down there and we'd visit and we'd talk and we would just be talking about the things that we were doing. And it probably, yeah, my right. guess is started with, Hey, we're creating a piece of content for our corporate, for our B2B buyers around, why do it this way? And my guess is we just connected on, oh, wait, you know who has all that content? The the customer success team. You know where we can get a lot of that content is by just sitting with them and talking with them, yeah. going to meetings. You know, Jamie said a couple of shows ago that he didn't like, you know, anecdotes and things from teams. Like, that's how we developed a lot of content right. to then be able to say, we can use that for marketing purposes and demand gen purposes, and we can package it so that you've now got a library for the support team, the success team to say, well, I don't have to come up with the answer for that. Right. It's already in our library. And, and I think we started putting it in Salesforce in the library there. And then it became like, wait, our B2B reps need that content too. So they should be talking about when you get started, here's what successful companies do. And here's why you should be buying because now we know what that looks like. And I think that's exactly how it started. Although I don't, you know, I don't have the napkin where it's all written down. Yeah. Like onion, but you know. Yeah. Uh, and I, I like think, that. I think that's right, Jason. I, and it, we were, we were just kind of bounced off what are customers saying? What are we, what are we trying to market? What messages are we getting out? And, and on our side, we were always looking for, 
hey, we want a reason to call customers besides when they're calling yeah. us for training or problems. Like, let's let's call them and see what's going on or figure out what's going on in their business. And Jason would write and team would write something about, you know, what's going on in hiring. And and we'd use that as an end to make calls. Hey, have you seen this piece of content we put out? And that, that yeah, motion PR is stuff. still super important today because we're – we're trying to get away from like, hey, just a quarterly QBR, show up, we'll show you the stats. Like we want to have reasons to reach out, to call them that are that they're going to find valuable and to think of us um, for all the companies I've worked for, right? As as not just a thought leader, but providing real solutions and value to them. And so that marketing component, the content component, PR, whatever you want to call it, is super important to be able to help us get customers on the phone to talk about the things that we think are going to help them be better that might be within our platform easily done or something that they should think about in the broader context that maybe we could, again, hire a professional service uh, engagement for them for. I, I think the product team had a lot to do with this too, right? Because yeah. if you think about where we were at Career Builder, so you had all the like commercial, mainly all the commercial kind of sales focused people were up in Chicago and, and out in the offices. And then all the product and development teams were together and the customer success teams were together in Atlanta. And so there was a huge connection with product. So when, when I would go down there too, one of the things I did is spend a lot of time with the product team. Go, what are you doing and why are you doing that? And how do you know that's the right thing to do? Um, what are you testing? And it just became this, we'd literally sit around and drink beer or have coffee and be like, wait, you're testing that? You're doing it for this reason? Oh, that's cool. I could use this for that. And there's this very organic conversation, kind of the development of that. And I, and I, yeah, and I think one of the things we did well was sort of, launch things and try them, launch things and try them like over and yeah. over and over. Yeah. I think it's sort of yeah. a hallmark of, of that product organization was that, I mean, Hope did a great job of that. I thought, which was just continually putting things out in the market and seeing what happened. Yeah. Hope. It's another one. Yeah. yeah. Put her on the list. Hashtag. At. <laughs> so, so we got product tickets are key because you needed some type 100%. of data to figure out. When did tickets come into play? Now everything's a ticket because we were growing so yeah. fast. Yeah. You had everybody uh, doing their little whirlwinds in their silos and you needed to kind of harness all that energy. When did tickets come into play? Zendesk for that? Was it, did Zendesk yeah, even I exist mean, then? No, it was like, because if you think about, I mean, this is dating, but like the support side really dealt with the consumer side, right? The job seekers. We, yeah, my, that my, my favorite my support team. team I would Go say ahead. my favorite support conversations were sitting with somebody on the support team. And I'd, I'd also do that, like sit down and yeah. listen calls. And it was always like a, the one, my side of the side that I could hear was always, okay, it's not working. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. W okay. Would you look underneath your desk and see if you, your if the cords plugged in? <laughs> okay. There's certainly yeah, some that of should, that these that days, right? Help. That should help. And there was like, people would, they had their, couldn't use it. So they were calling us. To complain but their computers weren't plugged in yeah yeah, yeah. There, so, there, i mean there's so, some of that but those. i but i think pete like we literally were having this conversation today in a, in a uh leadership meeting which is the voice of the customer comes from a bunch of different places right the 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 customer success people will get it as part of their anecdotal conversations we'll get it in the sales process but to your point the ticket piece i think is where you get the best um you know you, the best data and sort of the what I consider to be that some of the easier things, like if customers are continually calling you about a certain feature that they can't figure out or something that they want, like that is the easiest thing to put on your roadmap to do two things, make it better and easier for them to use the software, which is what everybody wants. And you start taking pressure off your support team from an operational perspective. We're in the middle at comply of just starting this. Um, and the first, like we are allocating in every sprint a chunk of time around the top ticket types that come in and what we can do to fix those. So what we're hoping is we'll see cases per customer start coming down over time instead of sort of increasing with growth because we continually get, oh, we, we need to knock that one out. That would be 200 cases a year, right? Doesn't seem like a ton, but you do enough of those over the course of the year and then you get a better UI UX experience up front and you get less pressure on your on your support center on the back end and it's magic, right? That's, that's how I think the more you can do those, uh, the better you get. And then you get all the normal stuff, right? Success as big customer X wants, Y wants it to do A, B, and C. Well, we're going to do, we're going to launch A and B in, a, in six months and, you know, we'll launch C in nine months. That stuff all needs to be recorded too. But that ticket piece, I, I think is a real treasure trove of data to make the software better. The reason I bring up the, these simple things is 
technology is only useful to help you speed up a process. And if you don't have an original process to start with, you just keep layering this technology on top of technology, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Bill, at your company now, where are you at now? Yeah. And how have you taken things to the next level to go from career builder to where, where you're at? How How has the uh, customer service or customer success or what is your title now, Chief Customer yeah. Officer? Chief Customer Officer, which I think is, you know, an emerging title over the last yeah. three or four yeah. years, right? We we just know, hired one. Yeah. So I, I think it's relatively new. So I I was a sales leader previous to coming to Career Build. That was sort of the, the place where I flipped to the customer side. So I'm now at, uh, and I've done three or four of these software, high growth, um, uh, both at Sales Loft, at least Query, and now Comply, where... Um, I'm in charge of basically what happens after the DocuSign is signed for the sales deal. So that sort of includes the onboarding experience, right? Make sure they get launched, they get configured. There's no, they get comfortable with the software and the change management that goes into it. Then there's the success play, which spans sort of the whole rest of the relationship. Tech support sits underneath all of that, right? The break fix side. And then we have, I have responsibility for renewals. I have a very small um, uh, customer education team, a guy's doing it sort of three quarters of his time to continue to build training in different ways and aspects so the customers can get their best play. And so to your point, um, my, my whole job is just to make, you know, the thing I think about the most is how do we make the renewal a cinch and how do we find other opportunities in our base to sell these products and services? So at Comply, We've, uh, acquired, we've acquired three companies over the last 18 months. And so we now offer technology education and consulting in the space. And so our base is all the way from, we are SMB, true SMB to enterprise. And so in all that, there's, you know, all those customers need some sort of continuing education in our space, which is financial firms. Um, and they need consulting in some cases because they can't afford to do it themselves. You talked about layering technology on top of technology. Our compliance departments are our customer. They never have enough resources, but they certainly yeah. have a high threshold that they have to keep uh, to keep the company compliant and safe, right? So there's a high expectation level. So we try to do that for them and, and we either try and help them through the platform and build their process through the platform in a way that's going to show true ROI that they can go back and show their organization that they this software has saved them this many FTE or dollars. Um, and then if they can't figure it out for themselves or they don't have the enter or the ability to hire more people, we offer that education and consulting piece. So that that's sort of my, my day, what I think about all the time. And I try to spend as much time talking to our executive team about what we're hearing um, from customers and what our go forward plan is. And then spending a bunch of time talking with my team, obviously, and then our customers to figure out uh, what their challenges are in 23. And largely it's the same, right? Small departments, high expectation of compliance, big problems if you don't uh, comply to those things. And so our suite of uh, services and, and technology are really there to help serve that, that, that set of organizations. So one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on the show, Bill, is because this um, customer success has become a serious part of, of revenue operations. Yeah. Like just if you, if you take revenue, operations as an umbrella term to mean the way that that a company drives you know the the revenue that they get it's it, absolutely the customer side of it has become a part of revenue operations and to me you know i keep going back to like the the origins of of sass holes that that pete started it's like if you're young in your career if you're in a sales role if you don't necessarily know exactly what the next thing is you're managing people like there's this whole other side of the business that is as important, if not in some cases, more important than new logo acquisition. Mm -hmm. And it is all I mean, and that I think, Pete, that sort of that's what you're getting to. Like, when did it stop being support and start being revenue operations? Because that that has changed everything. Like that's yeah. now chief customer officers like a, that's a revenue carrying role. I mean, I'm, I'm in our GTM meetings, all of them, right? <laughs> yes. We're reporting Everything out to the you board. Yeah. yeah. And so, I, you know, I the, the answer on when is I would, you know, maybe mid-teens, 2000s, it started. And, and so I've, I've gone through certainly iterations, depending on the organization I was in, about how I felt about this. or, or Because I have felt that while, like, success people are good at, at they're helpers, right? They, they want to teach. Mm -hmm. They want to help. 
Um, they're probably not the best closers on the face of the earth, right? They're, they want it, but in, in, if you can sort of tap them into helping and give them good questions to ask, then they can drive leads to your sales organization. We've been working really hard on that at, at Comply. Um, and we were thrilled this year that we drove a million dollars in revenue out of what we call CXQLs, right? Which is leads yeah. from any part of my organization that are accepted, right? By the sales organization, like this is a legit opportunity. It's not fluff or whatever. We'd spiff on that once it was accepted. And then we, like we said, we closed an extra million dollars on that. And, and we have just scratched the surface there. Like we need to train better, train the teams better on how to talk about this consulting piece, how to talk about this education piece um, that we have and really um, help them just ask very, very, you know, normal, what about your business questions? Yes. Oh, this sounds like, have you thought about this? My, I, I talked to three other customers today. They, they have this education piece through us. Have you thought about that? How are you doing it? And um, I think in 2023, given the current macroeconomic environment, selling to your base couldn't be more important um, than it is right now. I think we've all seen new acquisition, new logo acquisition get tougher and tougher as, as you know, interest rates have gone up, et cetera, et cetera. So something we're really focused on, I think, you know, I've, I've iterated on this through my career. I've kind of been on both sides of the fence where I, I never wanted my success people to really be, to have a super high revenue um, focus. Cause I always thought that would drive away the customer to a certain extent, because there is that trust that you don't want to. Yeah. So now it's just, how do you manage it? Like, you know, give them the ROI, show them all the things that they're missing, ask a few good questions and try and drive that. And, and it's um, we're trying to be our, our BHAG for this year out of my group is to be, uh, 40% of the funnel for our install base sales growth next year. Nice. So we'll see if we get there. I, we, yeah. you know, we were obviously it's a BHAG, so we didn't get that last year, but we also just got yeah. this thing going. I have a, a terrific VP of, of customer for, success. For you young, youngsters out there, big, hairy, audacious goal. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, we're, we're working hard on this. Thanks, and so Pete. I think, I think Pete, to your point, like <laughs> as, as we've, you know, I think it's ebbed and flowed as, as depending on if it was easier to get new acquisitions or not. Uh, but this is a major part of what we expect our people to do, and we're going to spiff them accordingly. All right. That's you a said great spiff. leadership. Hold on, hold on. Too. He said yep, spiff yeah, yeah. twice. Uh, Bill, because yeah. I think while Pete thinks he knows what it means, it is sort of a big word for him. So yeah, well, it's, have to yeah. So that. let's 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 go backwards. So we we do. <laughs> Uh, we don't have the, we, we don't have them on a commission plan, right? Uh, it just it, they're not closing deals. So yeah. if they send a lead over and it's accepted by sales, we will play them out at a flat dollar amount, depending on what Co product. compensation motivates behavior. And yes, there's a fuzzy line. Here there. we go. Here we go. Come on. Pete, okay. The phrase. Yeah. How do you know you got a, a good member of the team? If you got somebody that's good, you're going to pay them more. What? How do you? How do you do that? Um, so I, I think we ran, basically we ran some experiments this year, right? We, we said, here's what we'd like you to do. Go out and try and do it. Then you see who does it. Then you, you train the rest of them based on who the stars are. Um, and what we've seen in our group is, um, it hasn't, the leaders have, I mean, except for one, I'd say she's terrific. Um, but the leaders always haven't been the same people, which means I think the people are getting adjusted to it, right? They're sort of experimenting with it. Um, and so, you know, we've made it, I think there's enough money in it that if they're good at it, it's a, it's an, um, you know, it's enough of an enhancement to their check that it's nice. But again, I don't think that my team or most customer success teams, and I may be, you know, people may disagree with this, but I don't think they're generally money motivated, uh, like salespeople are, or else they would be in sales, right? Cause they like the customer contact, but they don't want the quota hanging over their head and they don't want the 50% yeah. variable and all the things that we know salespeople don't mind. Um, but if they're, you know, if it adds enough to their check to let them get X, Y, and Z extra, great. And so as long as the sales reps think that it is a, an absolutely legitimate lead, we're going to pay them on it. And Where so I'm going with it on success, Bill, is when I, I had a, a, a success team 1.0 uh, back in the day, and I was trying to figure out, all right, if it's success, if the customer is getting success more money or we're generating a better uh, reach advertising more emails going out whatever it yep. is i'm like okay we've created more value for that client i'm going to pay you more money you know for that client how do you define success 
Because that's kind of where it gets into a, yeah. the, the problem with the salespeople, because the salespeople yep. overpromise, right? Yep. And then you got to go in there and that never happened at Career Builder. <laughs> it doesn't happen <laughs> anywhere. It doesn't happen anywhere. <laughs> never happens here. Never, yeah. ever. So yeah. how do you define what success is, plus or minus to you know, because the customer at the end of the day, when the three years is up, how do I know that hey, that was a good deal? Yeah. So I was, um, one of the things when I came to comply that we realized right away is that we weren't delivering that sort of success metric to the customer. And so knowing that, like I said before, compliance people don't have a lot of resources, um, we went right to ROI. And so we came up with what, you know, would be considered a pretty simple calculator to say, you know, we took four or five key things in the software that they did. We put a time value on it. Then we put a dollar that mean. We added up the time, that's a certain number of FTEs at X dollars, that's, you know, this much ROI when you paid us Z, right? And so we've been delivering that to our larger and medium-sized customers to really good reactions, right? So the customer's like, wow, I need to take this and use this internally so that I can either get more headcount or prove I'm being operationally efficient and all that. And then we think that helps us then on the renewal conversation, right? So any variable pay, Pete, back to your original point, um, that we we have for them that's not a part of this sort of SPIF program is really based around company renewal rate, right? So their book is their book and, and they're all shooting for the same things and all books are not created equal. So we've kind of gone with what's the company renewal rate as a portion of their bonus, which is, you know, a small amount of their, their variable or their total is variable, quite frankly, but just enough that if we have a great quarter, we'll celebrate that and pay them a little more for it. And if we don't, then we're all going to take a little hit on it. I had something similar called the engager meter. Too bad uh, Carney's not here to uh, give me crap about it. <laughs> but does the salesperson bring up that metric on the call, or is that the first meeting that the success rep has after? Because if if the salesperson says, "Hey, look, the the goal of you buying this product, your life will be better at the end of this time period because you are right here, and I'm going to take you yep. right here." Does the salesperson talk about that or is that the success person after they buy? So, so we definitely, we have an installed base sales team that works in partnership uh, and our, I would say our medium to larger accounts more specifically where they, they are hand in glove with this, the, the success person and the renewal person to really paint the picture of what's going on for our larger customers so that we can, and we're very focused on multi-year agreements. I'm, I was glad to hear you say three years because that's a, a thing we're right in the middle of right now. So yeah, we're, we, we have that involvement and I th- I say, you know, like we did at Career Builder and candidly, like we did at Sales Loft and other places, we have a good partnership between there. And I think we're, you know, we're always towing the line of what's too much selling versus too much success and trying to, there's always going to be back and forth there, but the teams work really well together. And so I think to your point is, yeah, the sales is helping us deliver that ROI message. What they're doing is like, we're kind of talking about it. And then they're taking saying like, oh, well, here's on, on the, all the things we calculate ROI on, here's four things you're not using, right? Some of them are paid. Some of them might be free or just features they're not um, utilizing as much. So then we can start that conversation of like, oh, okay, well, I could get more ROI with a pretty minimal investment if I added, in our case, like political contributions. Uh, let's think about that. So yeah, we're, we're our, our teams have worked really well together on that. Again, both those things kind of started this year. We hired that install-based sales team um, and we got them working together with the sales organization. And we're definitely, um, that's going to be a big part of our go-to-market motion this year. So Bill, what's what's worked? What hasn't worked? Let's just say in the last three years. Um, well, I say I three say, years because of COVID. COVID screwed everything up. Yeah. So I, I'd what, say customers yeah. definitely uh, respond well to ROI, and if especially if it's believable, mm-hmm. and like we we tell them like, hey, call us out. You think this met? You think this calculation is too high? It's it's doing this. Like, call us out and let us help us fix it. So I think ROI plays a big part. I think customers on multi-year agreements on renewals and in new logo sales are looking for that cost certainty right now. So they know they're only going to get a 4% increase over three years. They're willing to make that investment, especially in a a software like ours, where it's a lot of work to unearth it and go to somebody else. Right. So they're like, okay, I'll stay for three years, but let's make a deal on. So I've got, I've got the cost certainty. Mm -hmm. I would say the things that, that we've struggled with are, um, getting what I call advocacy, right? So quotes, video testimonials, case studies, 
Um, you know, references are a little bit easier, I would say, but in our world where everything's around compliance, like people don't want their name on stuff. We were just talking about this today. You know, yeah. case studies are tough to get. Those video testimonials yeah. are tough to get. We, even if we anonymize things, they're kind of like, eh, we don't really want anybody to know what we're doing. Yeah. So that advocacy piece that I think is so important, it helps the new logo acquisition stuff. It helps your brand on your site. It helps tells your story in the market. Like those, I, I feel like over the last few years, those have been hard to come by and, and even referrals. Like, I feel like I've been banging my head against the wall, three different ways to get those, that thing going. Um, what else would I say isn't working? I think it's just, you know, I, I think you continually are are messing with this motion of how do you sell to your install base really well? Like where do the leads come from? Who takes it over? How do you be salesy enough? How do you be customer focused enough? What's that magic um, part in the middle? Um, those Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, that's, it's, my, so, that's my line to SaaS salesman all the time. Is like, listen, I, I, your product's good, but the second I buy it and I don't have a plan to use it, there's a second I decide to not renew, and then that's on you. That non renewal's on you. So, you can call me every single month, and my story's not going to change until I have a plan to use this thing. Right. Um, you know, and, and and usually that that does the trick. They're like, yeah, I get that. Okay, so let's move on to a different type of conversation or something. I, well, I bought, I bought a significant piece of software for our business and, and had a conversation with the CRO there and said, um, you know, I, I want to be your test case. I want to be the one you try things out on. I want to be the thing that when you're thinking about an idea, right. I want to be involved in, I want all mm -hmm. the cutting edge stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's a little bit of, it's a little bit of a test, right. Are they going to come to me with this stuff? Right. I'm not going to be their biggest account. I'm going to be somewhere in the middle, but like, I, I don't like with our customers, I don't want to like rip this thing up from by the studs and start it over again. So yeah. bring me everything. Right. Yeah. So I had yeah. this very direct conversation with CRO and I'm like, bring me everything you got. And so we'll see, right. I signed a three-year deal, but like to Jason's point, if it's nuts six months in, or I don't hear from my success manager or whatever, all the things are, I'm not getting like, Hey, we're coming out with this. What do you think? Um, then you make those decisions. Yeah. Chief customer officer, does that mean you're sitting in the boardroom? Yeah, I'm in every board meeting, every board update. Um, and usually my 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 presentations involve a few things. So it's always on gross retention, right? Uh what what are, what is your gross retention rate? Uh I we talk about my part of net retention, right? Which is the downgrades and the cancels. And then really we talk a lot about our lead program. Um, as well. And then it's, and then it's, I try and talk about voice to the customer. What are we hearing in the marketplace? Um, what are, what are customers asking us for? Where's our risk? Um, and, and those kind of things are usually the things that K1, who's our uh, primary equity owner cares about. Um, and we talk about, you know, time to onboard, making that, you know, as significantly easy as possible and, and support to an extent to get some airtime. But generally it's, it's about renewals. It's about um, upsell. What are we contributing and where do we see risk in the business? Um, you know, K1 is very anal analytic, sort of metric focused. And so from my seat, that's what they want to hear about. So do you speak first or is the CRO speak? Do you have a CRO yet? We have a CRO. Yeah. Um, we actually have a chief growth officer and then we have like a Jesus. sales and marketing right. person who, who rolls up. Right. Um, who speaks and, first in the board meeting. Um, I would say, I would say we, well, I would say, well, yeah, the CEO has a session at the beginning that we're yeah. not in. And then I but would nobody say that knows it, what goes on. Right. One thing that, that we do that's interesting is, um, we do do sort of a, like finance usually will go first with like the, the flash of where we are. Right. Which is generally already known. Right. Yeah. But then within our board meetings, like two or three groups do a deep dive every time. So like I might have like an hour to go through my plan for the, it's generally all future facing. Right. And then tech might dev might go and product. And the next time it's sales and marketing. And so, you know, generally it's like 15, 20 minutes on my stuff or like once a year, I have a real deep dive look into the future, which was mine in Q3. So we, it's a little bit different that way. I would say than your normal, everybody does, you know, 15 minutes worth on their stuff. Sometimes you do a little bit and then, then other times they're, they're there to hear, your full plan, which is, uh, it's, it's good to get that input from a board who's got lots of perspectives. Well, all these different C levels now, my goodness, what is, I ask this on every show and everybody gives me a different answer. Like where did this chief revenue officer come from? Is that sales and marketing? And then chief growth officer, it's the CEO chief 
customer officer, holy crap, who's responsible for what? Yeah. So I think like within, within our org, um, uh, we have a chief sales officer that's like new logo and install base sales. Right. And, and NRR, right. Cause we do have some consulting engagements and things like that education that are NRR marketing, right. Is the go to market motion, PR, um, brand events, customer marketing, which is, I think a whole nother thing, Jason, and I could probably talk about for an hour, which is yeah. again, yeah. and success has sort of come on to the, um, forefront in SaaS, then customer marketing has been a fast follow, I would say for sure. And then chief growth officer oversees both those, like just to make sure that, that everything from it responsible for that whole motion. Cause if you think about it, like you guys have seen it, like SDRs report to sales. There are some places they report to marketing. Sometimes they report into the AE. Sometimes the AEs are sourcing their own deals. Like it's all very different. So we've put one person in charge of that entire motion um, and where he and I overlap is really on the renewal side and then me driving leads into the business. I'm still responsible for, for the renewal piece, but I think like, if, and if you go back to this installed lease play, like we need to be really smart about how we go to this renewal and not waste that opportunity to perhaps talk about all this good stuff that we've got now that we've, you know, done a bunch of acquisitions. And so I think we're thinking through how that, how to get the renewal and then have another conversation or have one conversation. Like, how do you how do you manage that flow really well? So I would say chief growth officer does that I report uh, to a president who sort of like call it all things operational, dev, tech, product, me, and then our regulatory um, education consulting arm. Is there a headcount level that comes into play when, where these titles come into play? I, I mean, I think, you know, I, I think that's, you probably ask, 20 people that get 20 different answers. That's why I asked. Um, I, I, yeah, I do think that it has to do with the growth trajectory and what the plan of the business is, right? So I think like if you're planning on, like at Sales Off, we were growing great guns all the time. So we were hiring leaders and then putting people underneath, right? So that when people came in the door, they would be led by people who knew what they were doing manager-wise. I think that it just it just depends on your growth span, right? And and what you're what you're trying to do, whether you're trying to acquire, whether you're raising money to go get into a different part of the market. I think it just depends. It's also recruiting tools. Hey, let's talk about customer marketing quickly. Um I my experience and my my like hunch is that customer marketing begins as a bunch of disjointed tactics. And then somebody says, oh, wait, 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 wait. We got to stop doing like 12 things. And like, what's the goal? What's the strategy that yeah. comes after yeah. you start doing a bunch of point solution type stuff? What's your what's your experience there? What does customer marketing mean? You know, sort of an open-ended question, but, but right. what, what are your thoughts there? So I, I think it's exactly what you said. And I can go back to my, my last job at Least Query, where when I came in, I said to Joe Schaub, who was the president of the company, I'm like, I know that I need customer marketing to do the following things, right? Help me drive adoption, right? Help me get these advocates for the business that we want, right? Help us find stories, right? Case studies, all those kind of things. Help us on the renew the re I'm sorry, the renewal process as well as like good looking communication, newsletters, like interviews all that kind of stuff and so what happened was i hired that person and my my marketing experience is just watch like watching folks like jason i've never really run a marketing piece so i you know after a year we had all the pieces together we had sort of eliminated to jason's point some of the noise on the outside and really focus on advocacy renewals and adoption is the thing um but then then it gets to a point where i couldn't give this person who's doing a great job a bunch of growth opportunity and so we moved right. that piece back into marketing where they would sort of see the whole picture benefit from all the tools all the sorts of things that um that we would do and so um i, I think it's a great investment to your point jason i think you have to figure out what you want it to do and so yeah. somebody between customer marketing and then my role or a vp of success or whatever needs to be closely aligned on what that piece is what they're doing um because otherwise um my experience or things i've seen is there they just they sort of, they sort of do what marketing wants them to do without any customer uh, side input, and that was where yeah. I, for a while I wanted my own person, and then it became clear I couldn't get them far enough along, right? Because I just don't yeah. know the marketing side of it. Well. I, think, I think the measurement of that is 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 challenging too, right? You don't want to do yeah. all these things. Like, show me that all this effort on a newsletter is is doing anything to the business, and that that's 
that's really challenging and it sort of takes the wind out of the sails there, but it, it does at least force you to say, what do we want to say to our right. customers about does. what we do? <laughs> okay. We, what we looked, format yeah, we looked at that? traffic and, and, you know, we just hope we were get, like, we looked at traffic of the emails yeah. and just all the normal stuff, but like, we couldn't really prove it led to more adoption because more adoption comes from lots of different plays, right? Customer marketing, the CSM, yeah. whatever. Um, so yeah, it's tough. Right. So I think that that's why we moved a little bit to this advocacy thing. It's like, let's drive up G2 reviews. Let's drive up case studies. Let's drive up. Exactly all those things um, that we could kind of measure and see came from a result of those campaigns. Bill and Jason, I think this is something that'll speak to both of you guys. Do people do surveys anymore? Like how, oh, sure. how, cause there's only so many emails somebody's going to consume. So one of those, the, <laughs> the hierarchy has to be the survey, just checking in. Would you yeah. recommend me to a friend? Like what, what yeah. do you guys do? How often yeah, Jason, do you do it? Yeah, uh, we've we, got an NPS play, but I, yeah, go yeah, ahead. So Jason. do we. Yeah, so do we, and and we do, we do um, quarterly NPS, but it's but it's not everybody. It's you know, right. Some people are cycled, and yeah. then um, we do usage based NPS inside the product because you know you get different mm. people using than you do taking the getting the email sometimes. So we'll do that, and that rotates too. So Pete, you come into you come into the product and it's not every time you come in, you get an MPS survey, but once in a while. You yeah, that that's almost nearly exactly what we do. So we, we go out to the base uh, at certain points in time. You're only going to get hit like twice a year and not right on top of your renewal, right? We want to know in advance. And um, and then, you know, we kind of, the feedback comes in, we kind of break it up. My, my own personal uh, experience with this is that like 75% of it's kind of product related, right? So um it's good for product to take that and feed that into the machine that they're doing to, you know, figure out what their roadmap needs to be. And then there's, you know, probably 25% that comes through my group. Like my support experience wasn't great or it was really great, or mm -hmm, I have mm -hmm. this question and so we sort of handle it that way. So, um, you know, I think they're to answer your question, I think our customers are getting hit like twice a year. Now, I think the other thing Pete um, is to your question is uh, NPS is nice because it's simple and you know people like simplicity and it's easier to get them to respond to one thing than it is maybe answer 30, score, 30 score. questions yes yes not promoter score um but but there is a need to like understand customer health in a in a in a sort of a more deep fashion than nps may do that and and i i'm I guarantee bill you have this issue, which is some data is really good. Some data is really bad. You've got NPS and now you have to triangulate customer health on yeah. good, bad, and very simple data. And so the, the conversation then comes up like, well, could we do more surveying or a different survey to do that? And I think that's where you have to, like your face tells, tells yeah. that story perfectly, Bill. Like you have to be really careful because the second you start, oh, well, we'll just ask three more questions. Well, what keeps you from asking four more or five yeah. more? And are they you don't getting answer, any not, better they data? They don't answer it, right? right. I think and then they don't first, answer it. That's my first response. Right? Yeah. 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 So I think it's, you got to, you got to like totally think about how you do that and what you get yeah. out of it. And, 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 the, I, and the reason like, for it. Yeah. The health score is an, an important topic because I feel like, um, you know, there's a million ways to do it. You know, I, I think we've tried it three or four different times and, and it still is no guarantee of success. So like we, we had a really, uh, we, we looked at our adoption at sales loft really closely. We had true data scientists go in there and tell us these are the five or six things that really matter. We set up scoreboards for our CSMs and looker and they would go, you know, they get updated daily. They could see who was changing, who needed attention or who hadn't logged in or who hadn't done the key things or whatever. And we would still get surprised. We'd get these all green customers all the way across and they would cancel with us and go to the competition. We were, were stunned, right? So I think like it's an indicator. And I think, you, you know, the better your data is um, and we're experimenting with some stuff right now at Comply that could be super cool, I think. That is not just about the health score. Like what are you, what are, where are you on adoption? But like, are you doing things that we've benchmark in our system that many, many other companies are doing, which I think is like a step further, which is super cool. Um, but I think like people get relying on that health score. If you're in the market for CSM software, like Tatango or Gainsight or any of these, like they tout that health score piece. My thing yeah. is like, it's gotta be a piece of the puzzle, but boy, if yeah. you're hundred percent relying on it, good luck. 
we we've just rebranded. Um, we we were we were we are now comply sort of the the umbrella brand for all our companies in compliance. Um, uh, so we're excited about that and what twenty three is bringing. I would say that you know I I listen to uh, this you know Jason Lemkin's Saster. That's where I try and absorb all this SAS stuff mm -hmm. going on. Um, but yeah, I mean we're you know if if people financial institution uh, people are listening to this pod and. Um, need some help, like comply would be the best place for them to start. And I'm happy to take them through the process as to where they need to go. Um, we're thinking about starting a podcast this year. Uh, we'll see if that comes off. I know a good, you should advisor. have Pete. I know you a good advisor. <laughs> I know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jason, uh, 2023 is going to be rough. You got a bunch of these three-year contracts out there. We're, we're... I'm going to bring up the dreaded word discount. Yeah. <laughs> Who decides? <laughs> I mean, the sales rep is at a certain level. The man, your buddy, the chief revenue level. officer decides. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, on the sales side, that's you know that that's on the revenue side. We have we have a range, like on my side, for the renewal people to work within, right? So yeah. we we want to get price increases. We know it's going to be a tough year to to get some of those, and um, we have goals we shoot for, but they have ranges that they're pre-approved for. And I have a director who's been doing this for four or five years and knows how to negotiate these deals. So thankfully for us, um, it's, it's a little, I, I mean, we're going to see price pressure this year, hundred percent. And so yeah. we're, but we've been through this dance before a little bit. And so I think we're, we're well prepped for it, but uh, companies who aren't like, I would say, give your frontline people the range at which they can work freely and without needing to get approval or any of the fake stuff that goes on behind the scenes so they can deal with the customers directly, give them the honest number and start the negotiation from there. You think we'll ever get to the point where if you're going to start with that success number, are these clients going to say, Hey, you know what? I'll pay you based on how well you perform. Um, haven't really seen that yet. I think sort of the buy seat or buy consumption models are sort of largely um, uh, accepted at this point. Um, and I think, uh, but I would say this, um, if a customer is coming in and doesn't have sort of, if, if, if the provider and the customer haven't come together with like what they expect to get out of this, and then you can't measure against that as yeah. the, as the year goes along, then, then you're yeah. asking for problems yeah, at renewal really time. True. Yeah. Yeah. And I, it might also depend on a little bit on the industry too. I mean, you know, when I was working in the, in the restaurant industry and that industry is highly metrics driven, that's what that's how they wanted to buy they wanted you know they almost wanted a guarantee um and so you know I'm some sure. industries really want that yeah. yeah bill mahoney jason ferrara thank you for your contributions on the sassel podcast it's been a pleasure boys good to see you bill, great having you on bill thanks for doing it bill best way it. for uh people to find out about comply yeah www.comply.com We'll give you all the information you need uh, about all of our offerings, both consulting, education, and technology. Mention SAS holes and receive 95% off. <laughs> Mention Pete Jansen. <laughs> and have, make sure they know to call Bill Mahoney after 98 that. 98% yeah. off. Yeah. Our show is supported by listeners and viewers just like you. DemandFarm.com. Unlock key account growth with Demand Farm's large deal, key account, and relationship intelligence products. Go to demandfarm.com now to schedule a demo. Ask for Iron Man. Brent Keltner's Winalytics Revenue Acceleration Playbook Masterclass. In five hours over five weeks, help your sales and go-to-market team build the mindset and skills for a new buyer environment. Kick off in product-driven selling versus authentic conversations for all go-to-market teams. Team-level sessions for self-assessment and team dialogue. All go-to-market team wrap-up to identify top go-to-market strategy adjustments. Go to winalytics.com now.